Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Now, here's Mother Miriam. Good morning, beloved family. How are you doing today? I pray that you are well. I pray that all manner of things are well. And we are able to return today to our the, the catechism. The catechism explained an exhaustive explanation of the Catholic religion, a practical manual for use of the preacher, the catechist, the teacher, and the family. Um, and I tell you, uh, we're going through this together, but I have not found a better one. I am so pleased with with this catechism, and I'm looking for that little light of mine, and I think I'm not going to make it shine because I don't know where it is. So let me see if we can do it without that light today. We'll do the best we can. We are on the section of um, Holy Scripture and Tradition. And um, I wish I had my Bible with me because it's, it's, to show you, it's all taped up. They say that a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone that's not. <laughs> so it's, it's the Word of God, and for us to be in it every day, it's our food. It is our food. And uh, when I was an evangelical, uh, for 18 years, I read it through just about every year and memorized so much of it and thought nothing, we had nothing more but heaven. But it's not so. We have the Bible and tradition. Tradition not man-made, but with a capital T, just as, um, just as sure as written tradition. We have verbal tradition uh, by word of mouth. Apostle Paul says to cling to all the tradition he has taught them, both in writing and uh, and orally. Both of them kept, given by the Holy Spirit through men, kept by the Holy Spirit through men. Both of them. Truly wonderful. And the treasure that has opened up to me since becoming Catholic, uh, there's no way to describe it. People say, do you still read through the Bible every year? And I say, no, I don't. Uh, do I read the Bible? I do. But do I read it through every year? No. There's so much. Uh, I came into the Catholic Church, and I was like a child with her nose up against this, the size of a store, um, Sam's Club or Costco, or a huge, huge, huge merchandiser. And it was, it was a candy store that big. And my nose was pressed against it. And I, looking inside, I said, it's all mine. It's all mine. I could not spend a lifetime going through it, let alone eating all the candy. Just That's how I felt. But I still feel that way. There's no way to plumb the depth of the treasure that God has given us in his church, through his sacraments, his people, his ministers, uh, the faith, the faith once delivered to the saints, which... We didn't have the whole thing as evangelicals because our beloved Martin Luther had thrown out seven-plus books. And I had not read them before, but what a treasure they are. What a treasure they are. I wish I could let all my evangelical friends know what they're missing, that they were taught was of the devil, and it's not beloved. It's of God. It took me five years to, to um, search into the Catholic Church and I, I'm happier every day that I'm, uh, I'm happier every day that I'm Catholic, that I'm alive, that I could love him and praise him for all that he's done. I'm going to try to read this um, without my little light, which I don't see. So I'm going to give it a try. So we are in the section of Holy Scripture. Holy Scripture, um, you know what I may do? Let me 
me give it a try. Holy Scripture, or the Bible, consists of 72 books which were written by men inspired by God and under the guidance and influence of the Holy Ghost. These 72 books are recognized by the Church as the Word of God. And as I mentioned the other day, they are the um, translation into English of the Septuagint that our Lord had and from which he quoted of the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament wasn't yet written in our Lord's day, but in my Protestant years, I believe we had, uh, I thought we had 66 books in total, um, and uh, rather than 73, because seven books of the Old Testament had been taken out. goes on to say, let me see, the Holy Ghost inspired in a very special way the writers of Holy Scripture. He moved them to write and guided and enlightened them while they were writing. Such as, um, I mentioned the other day, I try to think of an example of you're trying to teach your child to write and you put your hand over theirs and help them form an A and a B and a C, well, God didn't put his hand uh, on uh, his people, but he used them um, as a pen, as a writing instrument, and he spoke through them. As he spoke through the prophets orally, now he spoke through them to write. And they, he didn't override who they were, he did not override their personalities, but he, the word is superintended them. Uh, so that what he wanted them to write was written and that everything they wrote was absolutely true and inspired by God. St. Augustine says, It is as if the Gospels were written down with Christ's own hand. The writers of Holy Scripture, says St. Lawrence, just in the end, were like a musical instrument on which the Holy Ghost played. And yet they were not... So sorry, beloved. Okay, let me see if that'll work. They were not mere passive instruments. Each writer brings his own personal character with him into what he writes. They are like a number um, of painters who all paint a building which they see in the clear daylight. Quite correctly they see it in the clear daylight, but yet with a great many different points and many different perspectives. Something um, according to their respective talent and skill. Hence, it follows that there are, hold on a moment, there are errors in Scripture. We must not look to the individual words, that is, to the general sense, not to the individual words. Um, we must not, I'm reading this so poorly, beloved, I'm so sorry, it's because I don't have my light. Um, it's just a little dark in this spot. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take your calls first. And at the break, I will get look for my little light. I'll do that. I don't know where it went. I'm so sorry. This is small print. It's small print for me. So let me start. We'll do something different today. And I'll take some of your emails first. Um, and then we will, because I can enlarge that type, and then we'll go back um, to the book. I know it's a little little disheveled this morning, but um, it's fine. So I'm going to take a text from Ed. He says, Mother, I feel that our pastor is very irreverent during Mass, cracking jokes during the homily, telling stories between different parts of the Mass, even changing the words to the prayers. What would you do if you were in my parish? Dear Ed, I would make an appointment with your pastor. I wouldn't just speak to him after Mass. I would make an appointment, and I would go see him, and I would tell him these things face to face. 
and I would tell him how concerning, how distracting it is, um, how irreverent it is. Uh, I would speak to him face to face, and if he would do nothing about it, if he cares not, and even the thought of changing the words to prayer of the prayer, tell him as respectfully, uh, without anger, uh, come to him as a sheep and beg him. Say, you know, Father, I know you mean well. I, I'm sure you think you're doing well to bring us in, to be relevant, uh, but it, it, it really what you're doing is not just distracting us, but you are to our, you, you are um, attacking, in a sense, the holiness of God and the Mass, to be cracking jokes at the homily, uh, telling stories uh, between the parts of the Mass, and it, it's hurting us. May we beg you to change. May we ask you to change. And if he will, great. If he won't, then I, I think you simply need to look for another parish. Ed. There's the music for our break, beloved. I'm going to look for my little light and see if I can come back very quickly. We'll be with you in just a moment. There's so much confusion in our world today over what love is. By displaying a Catholic radio bumper magnet on your car, you'll help others understand love designed by God. Order your free bumper magnets at thestationofthecross.com. Just click on the Promote tab at the top of our website. We'd be happy to send bumper magnets for your... That's thestationofthecross.com and click on the Promote tab. Thank you for sharing Catholic Radio on the road. We stand at a crossroads in history. We can stand up for life, family, and a Christian culture, or we can stand idly by while the fabric of society becomes fundamentally anti-life, anti-family, and anti-Christian, slowly leading to its own demise. LifeSite News is the leading defender of life, family, and Christian culture. Through our news reporting, we seek to educate readers with information and zeal. They need to fight the most crucial battles of our day, and we need your help to continue that mission. You can support LifeSite News by following our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Another way to support LifeSite is to prayerfully consider becoming a Sustain Life monthly donor to help us continue to save lives in the culture. To donate, visit give.lifesitenews.com forward slash sustain life. Our staff of over 40 and millions of future generations, thank you for helping to save the culture. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. I am here with you on the Station of the Cross and LifeSite News, and I have my little light, so we're going to be able to read. Um, I think many of you could read this without a light, but not me. I used to be able to read it without a light. I tell you what, don't get old. You get a lot of problems when you get old, but you get to love God more. The scripture is so true that the outer man decayeth, but the inner man um, increases every single day in love for God. 
every single day. The inner man is renewed, and I'm experiencing that every day. So I'm going to begin to read this Holy Scripture again a little better. The Holy Ghost inspired in a very special way the writers of Holy Scripture. He moved them to write and guided them, enlightened them while they were writing. And he's quoting uh, 2 Timothy 2 and uh, 3.16, Matthew and Mark. It's a wonderful, uh, give you all the scriptures, this book, this catechism, to cross-reference. The Council of Trent and the Vatican Council have expressly declared that God is the author um, of Holy Scripture with Christ's own hand. It is as if the Gospels were written with Christ's own hand. The writers of Holy Scripture, says St. Lawrence Justinian, were like an inspired instrument on which the Holy Ghost played. And yet they were not mere passive instruments. Each writer brings his own personal character with him into what he writes. They are like a number of painters who all paint a building which they see in the clear daylight, quite correctly, but yet with a great many points of difference, according to their respective talent and skill. Hence, it follows that there are, um, there are no errors in Scripture. We must not look... Um, we must not look to the individual words, but to the general sense. We must not take offense at popular expressions which are not scientifically correct, as, um, as when the motion of the sun, sunrise and sunset, are alluded to. We know that the, the sun doesn't rise and, and set. Uh, same thing with the moon. Um, but the earth revolves and they revolve. Um, Moreover, since the Bible contains the Word of God, we must treat it with great reverence. Thus, the people always stand up when the Gospel is being read at Mass. Oaths, when oaths are taken um, on the book of the Gospel. In Mass... The deacons, um, in, in Mass, the deacon approaches the book of the Gospels with the incense and lights. The Council of Trent imposes special penalties on those um, who mock at Holy Scripture. The Jews had the greatest reverence for the Scriptures and the precepts therein contained. The 72 books of Holy Scripture are divided into 45 books of the Old Testament and 29, um, sorry, 27 of the New. Now again, the 45 books of the Old Testament, as a Protestant I said 39 because I was robbed of those other seven books that our Lord had put in the canon. They are moreover divided into doctrinal, historical, and prophetical books. On the Old Testament now, the historical books comprise, first, the five books of Moses, which contain the early history of man, the lives of the patriarchs, and the history of the Jewish people up to the time of their entrance into the Holy Land. I love reading them. It's the Torah, T-O-R-A-H. In Hebrew, it means the law. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They are so beautiful, those books in the Torah, the law. Um, our Lord quoted them. He said, if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me because he spoke of me. Moses wrote, uh, Deuteronomy 18, I believe, of a prophet to come greater than him. Moses wrote of Christ and the book of Hebrews says that Moses saw Christ, seeing him whom he believed, saw him in faith. 
very, very beautiful. And if you've not read the Old Testament, beloved, Genesis through Deuteronomy is just a story. It's a narrative. One book picks up where the other one leaves off. It's a full, continuous narrative. Very, very beautiful. Judges. Um, let's see, the second group now, uh, the books of uh, Joshua and Judges, which relate their conquest of Palestine and their struggle with surrounding nations. The third group, the four books of Kings, which recount their history under the Kings. And the four books of Kings in our Bibles are divided into First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, but those four books were one book at one time. The book of Tobias, which gives an account of the life of Tobias and his son during the captivity. And five, the books of the Maccabees, which relate um, the oppression of the Jews under Antiochus. The doctrinal books comprise the story of Job, the Psalms of David, Proverbs of Solomon, and the books of Ecclesiastes, Wisdom, and Ecclesiasticus. The, prophet, the prophetical books comprise the four greater prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and the twelve lesser prophets, uh, Jonas, Habakkuk, and so forth, on to the twelve. And the greater prophets are called greater because of the size of the book. They're just larger books. That's why they're called the greater prophets. And the smaller books are the minor prophets, just because of their size. And we come to the New Testament... This is just an overview now. We come to the New Testament. The historical books are the four Gospels, and you know them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the, um, and the Acts of the Apostles. Those are the historical books, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, including uh, the Acts of the Apostles, which St. Luke wrote. Um, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. He was the Apostle Paul's companion, and he can write an accurate account of that. The doctrinal books are the 21 epistles or letters, but they are the inspired letters, epistles. Um, one one uh, school class was asked what the epistles were, and one little girl raised her hand. She said, they're the wives of the apostles. Not so. <laughs> Not so. They are 13 letters. Um, let's see now. Uh, the doctrinal books are the 21 epistles, rather, including 14 of St. Paul's epistles. And uh, in my Protestant years, we would have said 13, but the Catholic Church teaches that the book of Hebrews was written by St. Paul, so that makes 14. The prophetical book is the Apocalypse, or we call it Revelation of St. John, which tells in obscure language the future destinies of the Church. Most of the books of the Old Testament were originally written in Hebrew. Most of the New Testament was written in Greek. The Latin translation of the Bible, called the Vulgate, is an, is an amended version of the translation made by St. Jerome about the year 400 A.D., after the death of Christ. The Vulgate is declared by the Council of Trent to be an authentic, um, authentic rendering of the Gospel. The Vulgate by St. Jerome is an authentic rendering of the Gospel. The inspired books were written in Hebrew and Greek, and some in Aramaic. The most important books of Holy Scripture are the four Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. The four evangelists relate the life and teaching of our Lord. The Acts of the Apostles recount the labors of St. Peter and Paul. That's what they are. The Acts of the Apostles are the labors of St. Peter and Paul, saints Peter and Paul, and their missionary journeys. It is the whole book of their journeys and the beginning and the spread of the early church. Continuing reading now. 
The writers of the four Gospels are called the four evangelists. Two of them, Matthew and St. John, were apostles. St. Mark was a companion of St. Peter, and St. Luke, a companion of St. Paul, on his apostolic journeys. St. Matthew's Gospel was originally written in Hebrew for the... um, For the benefit of the Jews of Palestine, St. Matthew wrote to those Jews, and he shows how Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament and poured himself into, I'm sorry here, and proved himself, rather, to be the true Messiah. He wrote to his fellow Jews to let them know that Jesus indeed was the Messiah and proved it umpteen prophecies in the Gospel of Matthew proving Jesus would be the Messiah. St. Mark wrote for the Christians of Rome and shows Christ to be the Son of God. So each Gospel shows a different aspect of Christ. Um, Matthew, the Messiah. Uh, St. Mark, the Son of God. St. Luke, wrote for a distinguished citizen of Rome named Theophilus in order to instruct him in the life and doctrine of Christ. We owe to St. Luke many details about Our Lady and many parables not given by the other evangelists. And I'll add to that that St. Luke, more than any other writer, shows us the humanity of Christ. Extremely beautiful. St. John wrote his gospel in his old age to prove against the heretics of the time um, that Jesus Christ is truly God. The gospel of John, more than any other gospel, beloved, shows the divinity of Christ. If you want to help someone know that Christ is God, go to John. Most of what's in John is not in the other gospels. And it shows that Jesus Christ is truly God. Beloved, there's the music for our second break. I apologize for the little choppy morning we've had today. Um, My fault. Um, We will be right back, though, and we will take your calls, your emails, um, your questions, your uh, text, if you wish. The toll-free number to call, 1-877-511-5483, or email at mother at thestationofthecross.com. We'll be right back.
Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back to Mother Miriam Live, beloved and we're here to take your emails, your calls, your text, call in with anything on your heart. It never has to be what we're speaking about. Um, and it, the toll-free number, one 511 5483 or text at that number, or email at mother at the station of the cross dot com. We have an email from Alex, and Alex says, A relative of mine who was raised Catholic left the church but eventually found Jesus again through a Protestant non-denominational congregation. She seems happy and filled with love for the Lord, and she is living a beautiful Christ-centered life. But it still breaks my heart that she is no longer in communion with the church. Should I be worried about her soul? Do you have any other thoughts about the situation? Alex, yes, you know, the temptation is as long as she loves God and she's living a wonderful Christ-centered life and she's alive and loves Christ and all of that, that you better leave her alone, but I would not leave her alone. Um, Again, there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church, and she has been Catholic. She didn't know what it was to be Catholic, but apparently she would have been baptized Catholic. And... um, I would go to her and with all your heart say, you know, I cannot thank God enough for your life in him, that you found Jesus again, that you love him, um, that you're living a Christ-centered life. I cannot thank God enough for what he's done in your life, but you're away from home. You're away from home. If you really believed that the Catholic Church was the church, the church you left, which you didn't know at the time, if you really believed... um, that the Catholic Church um, was the church our Lord founded, um, then you would come back home. If you really believed that Jesus truly, truly gives himself to us in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity, you would not stay away. If all of Protestantism truly believed that our Lord gave himself... um, um, uh, gives himself to us, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in the Holy Eucharist, they'd all come in. If anybody told you that um, Jesus, an apparition, he came to earth as he did when he walked with the apostles, and he stood among us, and he was appearing in St. Uh, Matthias's Catholic Church, you'd go, everybody, the, 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 the lines would be miles long to see him. And when you came, you wouldn't be interested in greeters or speaking or anything. If you saw Jesus, you'd fall down on your knees before him. But the fact is, he is there 24-7 in every single Catholic church. And tell your friend that if she understood that, um, she would come back home. And if she doesn't believe it, uh, it possibly is because she never understood it to begin with, but I would give her some books to read. I would give her Scott Hahn's Home Sweet Home, um, and um, I would give her um, uh, a little book uh, called This Is My Body. It was written by Mark Shea, This Is My Body. Um, There's so many beautiful books. The Hidden Manna, uh, published by Ignatius Press, written by Monsignor uh, James T. O'Connor. But um, give her the books of uh, Surprised by Truth by Patrick Madrid, 11 evangelical ministers who came into the Catholic Church. Ask her to read them. And she could say, but I'm not interested, I'm not searching, I've found the truth. You could say, I respect that, I understand that. Would you do it to save me? I'm Catholic. Do it to save me then, right? Read what Catholics believe, and we can talk about it. Because if it's truly the body and blood, if it's true that 
um, God did not found his church on scripture alone, and scripture alone, which you go by now, is not are not even words in scripture. You're going by something that is not scripture alone. There's no basis for that um, for that um, teaching. So speak gently to her, but yes, uh, I think you need to help her come back home to the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, we have a call from Gabriel in East Amherst, New York. Hi, Gabriel. Yeah, good morning, sister. How are you doing? Um, oh, pretty good, thank you. I was doing the call screener back in the, when I was in grade school, back in the late 50s, early 60s, the canon of the mass uh, we used to say it was 72 books told on the reverse of 27 in the New Testament. And just when uh, you get a good memory trick, somebody throws the monkey wrench in and they, I think they split uh, two of the books in the Old Testament and they say there are 73. Uh, do you know which book was divided and the reason for that. Okay. Um, Oh, dear one, I should know that. Um, Hold on just a moment. See if I can... I do know that. Um, Just as I I mentioned before that the four books of Kings, the Kings was divided into four. Um, I can't think of it offhand. Um, I'm so sorry. You know what? Let me... um, I'm not going to be able to give you an answer offhand. I'm so sorry. You know, I had memorized all the books. All right, just a moment now. It it is 73. Um, Let me just see if I can find something here. Um, But I I cannot. I'm so sorry that I can't answer you. I should be able to. Um... I'll need to look it up, dear one. Um, let me just see a few things. Maccabees, um, unscriptural. No, I'm not being able to. I can't put my hand on it right now. So um, it is 73 books, but let me um, um, let me do some work. Maybe on the break, if I can find it quickly enough on the break, I'll I'll get back to you during the next segment. And if not, we'll we'll get back to you on that tomorrow. Okay. So sorry, okay. dear Gabriel. I knew it, but okay. I, it's not coming to mind. Don't get old. You forget yeah, things. Well, that's what happens when we get past 50. Yes, I, well, at least. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, my dear brother. God bless you. And I will work on okay. that. I'll get back to you, sweetheart. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, dear. Um, we have an email from Michelle who says, Mother, I see that yet another closed Catholic church in our area has been sold to a group that will convert into a mosque. Oh, that's so heartbreaking, Michelle, isn't it? I understand the painful realities of dealing with these empty, unused properties, but I was wondering what is the process for closing and selling a Catholic church such that it is no longer sacred space, um... Uh, that it was when the Blessed Sacrament resided there. And more than that, the entire, the altar is consecrated. I don't know, Michelle. Um, I don't know the process, but hopefully the the consecrated altar, I mean, when a church is consecrated, its walls, the whole church is consecrated. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know the process of deconsecrating a church, and I certainly pray that... And no one would sell them uh, in their consecrated state to to Muslims. I certainly would pray that. I wish that the church weren't sold to anyone uh, but Christians. That's what I wish. Um, it's it's to me it's a tragedy. I think it's an absolute tragedy, and at all costs I would not do that. Um, but. I know it's done, and it's. I regret it very, very much. So um, th- that I cannot tell you what is done in individual cases. 
I would imagine, uh, as you do, that there is a, a process for that. I would imagine that, Michelle. Um, that's another thing I guess I could look up. Um, you might take a look at Catholic.com. The Catholic Answers, if you call them, one of their apologists will either know or be able to look that up for you. We have a question from Ray from Facebook. He says, I am on our parish council and a mid-sized city parish. We have a sense that the life of the parish has become stagnant. In our discussions about how to spiritually revive the parish, there has been a lot of talk about creating new formation groups, doing more community outreach, that sort of thing. These all sound like good things, and I'm not saying we should not do them, but I feel that the life of the parish begins with Sunday worship and grows from there. Where do you think the process of parish renewal should be focused? Um, You know, my first thought is the pastor, the priest. It's on the priest. He is the one who is the teacher. If a parish, if a priest gives homilies that are merely friendly and social and news of the day and all what we should be doing as Catholics but not teaching the faith, it's going to grow stagnant because the sheep, so to speak, are not being fed the Word of God, the teaching of their, certainly being fed the Eucharist, no question, but not the Word of God. The teaching is not there. I would say if the priest teaches the faith, teaches through the scriptures, teaches through the catechism, teaches through the entire faith of the church, and really gives good, um, well-prepared, meat-filled homilies, I think the church would grow on that alone because you'd have a, a, a church of parishioners who come alive, who know their faith, and you won't be able to hold them back from inviting people They'll say, you, you've got to come to our church. Our priest really teaches the faith. We're really alive. We do this, we do that. Yes. And then you could take little groups and go door to door and invite people. But to make that as a first step in a parish that's stagnant, you're just going to have more people grow stagnant. I wouldn't do that. It's not to be a social situation of all kinds of plans. It needs to be reverent and the teaching of the Word of God. The parish that I go to is a Latin parish, and the people bought it. It was a Methodist church that the people bought, a really small church, and uh, changed it slow by, uh, slowly uh, into a, a Catholic parish. And it was renovated and redone, but the size is still the same. And there was just a couple of dozen people that went to begin with, and now... Uh, It can't hold the people anymore. And it went to two morning masses from one, and it cannot hold the people who come anymore. Why? Because it's absolutely reverent, and the pastor teaches the faith every single Sunday. Um, And not every single mass, because at the low mass in the Latin church, you generally don't have a homily. But on holy days, um, on Sundays, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful teaching. And the parish is packed. It's reverent, and you, you cannot, I can't count the people anymore. Two masses that are packed. I think that's what needs to happen. You need to become a serious um, teaching parish. Um, and little groups that study the Bible and all, that's fine, but the pastor is the key here. It's not a Protestant show uh, at all pastor doesn't have to be a wonderful personality he could speak in a monotone but he needs to deeply teach the faith i know many wonderful pastors with good personalities who love the church who mean well but they do not teach the faith and the sheep remain weak it's all what we need to do we need to do this new plans but they don't deeply know the faith find me someone that knows and loves the faith you won't be able to keep them from telling others. That's my thought, Ray. Um, So maybe you could go to your pastor and and speak with him as well. Uh, There's the music for our break, beloved. We'll be right back. Call in with anything on your heart. Toll free, 1-877-511-5483. We'll be right back. 
Users of iCatholic Radio are leaving inspiring reviews in the iTunes and Google Margie says, My at the same time. Love it. LifeSite News is an international news agency devoted to defending life and family and restoring Christian culture. We aim to educate and activate our readers with the information they need to fight the most crucial battles of our day in their churches, workplaces, and families. Our motto is Caritas in Veritate, love in truth. We firmly believe that promoting the truth is an act of love, however hard it is to hear. Over the last 20 years, we have built a reputation for uncompromising reporting, no matter the cost. LifeSite News is by far the most popular pro-life website on the internet, with over 40 million unique users every year and growing. Check us out at lifesightnews.com. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to uh, Mother Miriam Live and you are welcome. This is our last segment. You're welcome to call in with anything on your heart. Toll free one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three, or text at that number, or email at mother at the station of the cross dot com. Gabriel, dear brother, if you're still listening, I've been trying to look up um, the figure of seventy two books. And I'm not able to, to find it. I'm so sorry. Uh, the count of the uh, Protestant books are 66, but the canon um, of the Catholic Church has 73. I'm not sure uh, if or when it has 72. I'm so sorry. I, I'm gonna, I would need to do more research on that. Um, and you probably could do the same research that I that I can do, but um, it it is seventy three and it's been seventy three. Uh, I'd have to find out if it was ever seventy two. The twenty seven books of the Old Testament and um, forty seven, rather twenty seven of the New Testament, forty seven of the Old. Um, I'd have to go back in history to to trace that, dear one. We have an email from Anne, who says there is. An engaged couple that I know, they are both atheists. They come from Catholic families and have decided to get married in church just to please their parents and keep the peace. If they are just going through the motions, would they have a valid marriage as far as the church is concerned? Should not the priest explain to them that they shouldn't do that? The priest should not only explain that to them, dear one, he should not marry them. Um, if they're not Catholic, they're not practicing, uh, they're, they're atheists, they have no rights, uh, R-I-G-H-T and R-I-T-E. They have no right to be married in the Catholic Church. And if they're doing it to please their parents, someone needs to tell their parents, the priest should, that they're going to be performing a sacrilege. They are not Catholic because they're married in a Catholic church. And so they, they must not be married in the Catholic church if they're atheists. And again, the priest should not marry them. To be married in the Catholic church is to agree to Catholic teaching, 
to uh, the moral laws, uh, to life-giving laws of no contraception, to agree to raise your children Catholic. And if you're not Catholic and living the Catholic faith, you cannot do that. To get married in the Catholic Church would be to perform a sacrilege and a lie before God and know their marriage would not be valid. So someone needs to tell them and the parents that. The best thing they could do is come home to the Catholic Church. Then it'll be all right. But... um, uh, but at this point, no, they, they must not be married in a Catholic church. And again, the priest should uh, not marry them. We have a text from Emily. Is it possible for a non-Catholic who has lived a holy and exemplary life to be canonized a saint by the Catholic church? If so, are there any examples that you know of? Offhand, no. I don't know of any examples. Is it possible for a non-Catholic um, who has lived a holy and exemplary life? Well, a holy and exemplary life does not get us to heaven. It is only the sacrifice of Christ that gets us to heaven. And if this person was not baptized at all, um, uh, but they lived a holy and exemplary life, um, can they be canonized a saint? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. And I, I personally cannot think of any examples of someone who was not Catholic being canonized. That doesn't mean that they cannot be in heaven. That's between God and the soul, their response to God um, at the moment of death. But uh, I'm not aware of any examples and uh, or that a non-Catholic uh, could be canonized. I, I don't believe so. Um, if we, uh, because someone who's lived a holy and exemplary life, they're not without sin. They're still the product of the fall. They're not without sin. Um, and if a baby uh, uh, who is not baptized, who is, is, is with original sin but not actual sin, um, if baptism is necessary for that little infant, it's certainly necessary for uh, an individual who is older and has lived so-called exemplary life. So I, I would I would say no. I don't have an official answer to that. Um, but I would not understand they could be canonized at all. Um, we have an email. Um, uh, let's see. And you say a um, you say a non-Catholic. Um, uh, there are Old Testament saints that can be um, canonized and that have been, um, and they, again, haven't had the baptism of the New Testament, uh, but they um, they are baptized by our Lord. So that's a whole nother, a whole nother thing. They believed God. They believed his promises, and they are saints of the Old Testament, and you could read who they are, at least in part, in the book of Hebrews. Um, chapter 11. We have an email from someone who writes in anonymously and says, I see these personal ads in the newspaper all of the time thanking St. Jude for answering their prayers. Could you tell me what those are all about and if it is a good thing to do? Well, I'm not able to answer a lot of prayers today. I don't know how that prayer, unfailing prayer to St. Jude came about. It's certainly a good thing to do if you mean it with your heart and if that's the prayer of your heart. But again, there's no magic to prayer. It is God who answers prayer through his saints. And it's not a prayer that's going to be magic. Pray this 20 times and your prayer will be answered. I think that's very disrespectful to God. God is not a magic genie. No. Um... But somehow, historically, that prayer came about. I would not negate it or put it down. I'd have to see it. I have read it myself. It's a wonderful prayer. But if someone, if their heart is sincere and they pray that prayer, God can certainly answer that prayer through St. Jude, no question. But don't look at it as a um, a rabbit's foot, as something magic. Um, We had a call off the line from Marie, and Marie says, in confession... 
Is it required to tell the precise number of times I have committed a certain sin to the best of my recollection, or is it sufficient to just say that the sin was committed several times? Sometimes when I think back on my sins, I cannot remember how many times it occurred. When you commit a sin, dear Marie, um, uh, I've had priests ask me how many times um, I've committed a certain sin. Um, and so um, uh, it is a good thing to say the number of times, but if you cannot remember, just say, Father, I've committed that sin several times, and I, I, don't, um, I don't remember how many times. That's sufficient. God doesn't hold us accountable for what we don't remember. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. We have a very short time to the ending of the program, uh, dear ones, and my little computer here just faded out. It's it's just blackened out. So it was so many distractions yesterday and today. I'm so sorry for them. But um, um, what is today? It's Tuesday, and um, it is the Sorrowful Ministries. It's mysteries. So what I would say to you is if you're not praying the rosary, pray today's rosary. Enter in to the the crucifixion of our Lord, his agony in the garden, his scourging at the pillar, his crowning of thorns, his walking on the way to Calvary, holding his cross, and his final death and crucifixion. It's, it's an awfully gruesome thing to follow, but it was all for us, and we could say, couldn't he have done it another way? Apparently, God can do what he wishes, but he didn't do it another way, dear ones, and it's for you. Let us together live a holy life and depart from all sin. We'll speak with you tomorrow.